Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here at the Hannover Fair of 2023. We are talking about hydrogen, we're talking about fuel cells, and I'm welcoming you at the public forum, where we discuss with different people from the industry and from politics um, what is the future going to look like. My name is Mareike Schmalz. I invite you to sit down, have a drink there on the house. In case you want to participate in our discussion, just raise your hand and I will come to you with the microphone in case you have any questions for our next speaker. Next, we're going to talk about powering the future with fuel cells. And my guest will be Dr. Emery De Castro. He is CTO and Executive Board Member at Advent Technologies. Please give him a warm welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so nice to have you here. Yes. I hope you're enjoying the fair. No, certainly. And um, if you're here to see Vasily Gregorio, you probably know that I am not Vasily Gregorio, our founder of, of Advent Technology, but I'll do the best I can today. We're happy to have you here. Yes. So, Advent Technologies is an innovation-driven company in the fuel cell and hydrogen technology space. Maybe you can get a, give us a little overview of what you're doing and what your key areas of operations are. Ah, oh, certainly. And so, um, what we do is we have uh, fuel cell materials. Our core business is membrane electrode assemblies. This is really what makes fuel cells work. Membrane is uh, like a sandwich. You have a membrane in the middle, that's your meat, two electrodes on each side. And it's the properties of the membrane and electrodes that really determines how the fuel cells work. And what ours do that makes it so much different is they operate at over 100 degrees C, actually from ambient to 200 degrees C. This gives us certain features that many other fuel cells do not have. Uh, with regards to our organization, our headquarters is in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we have a group out in, in Greece, Denmark, Germany, so California, and Philippines. So we have a group really throughout the world. Yeah, I guess it's a global, uh, global issue. This is correct, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, you've already talking a bit about a technology. So I learned that you are quite flexible regarding the fuel and the fuel quality. Maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about that and why yeah. that is so crucial and why that makes your product so special. Yeah, in fact, because we can operate hot with the membrane, mem membrane electrode assembly, that means we have a very high tolerance to impurities that could be in hydrogen. So not only impurities you may pick up on the cathode side through air, so we can work in very polluted cities, but also it gives us incredible freedom on your source of hydrogen. So if you have biomethanol, that can easily be split apart into hydrogen or with some trace amounts of contaminants that we can use quite readily. Um, we can also work with pure hydrogen. Or if contamination gets into your pure hydrogen, we can still work solely because of the high temperature. That's amazing. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a really strong product. Yes. So I assume that you put a lot of importance on the topic of R&D, aren't you? Oh, yes, no, certainly. And I think everyone here in that our whole field is evolving and changing quickly. Um, unlike, say, a diesel engine that had 100 years to develop, we're really at the beginning stage, and so R&D is very critical. I mean, along those points, um, you know, we've had some key things that uh, sort, of, sort of benchmarks on where we've been on the, on the R&D path. So, for example, our Boston facility just opened up at Hood Park in Charlestown. It's a state-of-the-art development and manufacturing center to really develop the next generation processes for manufacturing. Um, we recently have been awarded an IPCEI. This is the important projects of common economic interest. Um, roughly 800 million US dollars to build a gigafactory for fuel cells and electrolyzers in Greece, in northern Greece, western Macedonia. And the reason being is that uh, in Western Macedonia, that's where the coal industry of Greece is. And the vision for this project, which I, I think is a vision we really should take around the world, is that as we divest of our fossil fuels as a main energy source, we have to think about the people that are impacted about that, their, uh, their jobs and their manufacturing lives. And so the idea of this plant in northern Greece is to then give a uh, next generation manufacturing jobs to people who worked in the coal mines before that. 
Oh, I love that. There's one of the last point. <laughs> <laughs> so, we talked, um, so we talked about Hood Park, we talked about the IPCEI, uh, and then there's a next generation membrane material that we're very excited about. And okay. this actually came from Los Alamos National Labs. They're one of the pioneers in the United States of, of fuel cell technology. And it's a it's unique uh, composition of matter that really for the first time gives high temperature PEM the ability to start up at ambient and then run all the way to 200 degrees C. And that's becoming a product today. So that's like three good, nice areas of R&D. That sounds very promising. Yeah. So, I'm looking a bit into the audience. Maybe there are some questions regarding the topics that we're just discussing. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, I have plenty of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so you already talked a little bit about the membrane electrode assembly, but I would like to go a bit more into depth. Um, why is it so crucial for the overall performance of the fuel cell? You could maybe call it like the, the heart of the yes. fuel cell. It, indeed, it is the heart. And basically, all the properties of the fuel cell and how it runs in a system comes out of that MEA. I mentioned earlier about temperature and running hot. Yes. So what makes our different is not only can it run hot, but unlike most PEM fuel cells, you do not need water for conductivity. Uh, and this gets us back to our phrase, right? Any fuel, anywhere. So we do not need water for conductivity. We can operate hot, which means fantastic heat rejection. All fuel cells, they're not 100% efficient. You put fuel in, they create electricity, but waste heat. A engineering problem is that it's hard to get rid of that heat. If you operate hot, it's very easy. Right? And so um, the MEA then allows wide range of fuels. It can operate anywhere, whether it be very hot or being very, very cold. Sounds good. So do you also use the heat later on to raise that, That's a great question. That's a really good question. And some of our customers actually take that heat and okay. they can use that to heat up a house or to run other processes. And so imagine starting with hydrogen and having a fuel cell that's around 45% efficient, but then using that heat to heat your house, you're now up to 90% efficient. And as we all know, since we're running towards a hydrogen economy, everyone is thinking about electricity with hydrogen, but you need to think about how to get heat and good heat. And so our technology is one of the few ones that can do both things at once. That's lovely. Yeah. So thank you very much on those deeper insights. Yeah. Um, the whole clean energy challenge is a big one for all of us and it's important for our future. And I think it's a topic that we can't solve like with a single company with a, or with a single group of people. So what importance do partnership, partnerships have in your uh, activities? Yeah, um, it sort of gets back to the, maybe the global problem, right? We have a global problem of, of climate change or fossil fuels. We here, everyone here at this fair is working to address that and to make a business out of it too. But then also with our regards, we have an immense amount of collaborations around the world. I mean, for example, uh, Hyundai uh, Motor Corporation, they started to evaluate our next generation MEA from Los Alamos technology. We've now expanded that to a joint development agreement where we're working a lot closer to make sure that's appropriate for heavy duty vehicles. Um, so that is, is that. We have an enormous amount of work with the European Union, uh, grants with them, as well as in the United States with our own Department of Energy. So it really is not one company will solve the issue, but really working together, I think we will solve the issues. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. So I learned that you've been in the industry or thinking about the whole fuel cell technology for a very long time. It's 26 yeah. years now, you started in... <laughs> some, some may say too long, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a too long. Uh, we hope you stay in the technology yeah. for longer. Yeah. And also this year, you are in your office as chief technology officer for 10 years. Yeah. So my congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Is there any particular project or milestone over the last years or decades um, that you want to emphasize here that you look back on with pride or is there something that you look forward to in the future? Yeah, but, well, certainly I, I tend as a person, I tend to think about today and what we're doing tomorrow. Um, but what I can say, you know, from the past and even come to the Hanover Mesas in the past, it really is energizing to see the advances. Uh, Ten years ago, there were a lot of more R&D booths, uh, smaller startups, 
But when you see today, it is amazing to see all the electrolyzer companies, the companies that are part of now a fuel cell or electrolyzer supply chain. So really, for the first time, I'm very optimistic that what we are doing today, everyone here in this room, we're really solving two things. We're making a business, and we're really addressing climate change. And that's been very exciting for me. It is. So, yeah, we're talking about sustainability. Yeah. I guess, yeah, there's nothing that could be more important nowadays. Yeah. So how is it affecting your daily work? Uh, with regards to sustainability in our daily work, um, I mean, that's, that's our mission. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we look at it not only from the bigger perspective of making clean energy, but even how we manufacture our components, even simple things like solvents and things of that nature. We have some patents on clean solvent using. So it's really part of our working lifestyle, sustainability. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. So are there any recent projects or achievements that you would like to emphasize hmm. um, yeah, that bring us closer to this whole mission of sustainability? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit uh, to answer your question maybe sideways, right? <laughs> is that um, our company had uh, an IPO roughly two years ago. At that point in time, we were a pure materials company, just a membrane electrode assembly. But through the IPO, we were able to uh, purchase two of the leading high temperature PEM stack and system companies. One was the former Serenergy in Denmark and Germany. The other was Ultracell in California. And this really achieved our vision then of having a vertically integrated company where one aspect of our market is stationary power, and that's with the Serene systems. And the other part of our, uh, our vision is mobility, and this is, has to do with the California group making very, very lightweight systems. So this is probably one of the biggest uh, accomplishments of the group today. And then lastly, the Los Alamos technology that would, now we're the commercialization partner would be the third. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, are there any questions from the audience so far? I, right now, I don't see any. Um, but when we look at the whole fair, we see that it has quite grown to a massive size um, over the last years. And we are very proud to, to be sitting here today, having such a large audience and so many companies being represented here. Um, to me, it really feels like a breakthrough point right now. But as you are in the industry for quite a while, yeah. you've probably seen many ups and downs mm -hmm. in the technology and in the trends yeah. that we were seeing. And we've been at this point that it felt like almost a breakthrough point a couple of yeah. times. Yes. Do you think it is different right now? Or do you think there's still like this danger that things could turn no. around? Yeah, I, I think it's different now. Um, what I would say in the past is the wind, uh, I'm a sailor, so the wind was always in our face, right? And we always had the go around to make the goal of clean energy. So it, in a way, it was industry alone. But then two key things happen. One, governments have looked around and said, there's a problem, right? There's a problem with energy, how we use energy. And now they've essentially joined us and become a little bit of the wind at our back. And lastly, the public is far more aware. Right? I could run to almost anyone on the street, and they understand hydrogen. They understand the impact of that for clean energy. And so now, for the first time, maybe the wind's not completely at our back, but at least it's not <laughs> right in our face. So I think it's totally different now. Yeah, that's a nice comparison. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I hope it gives you power for the future. I guess, as a company in the industry, we are now facing the challenge of scaling up, of delivering yeah. our promises. Is yes. that something that you're looking at too? Oh yes, uh, and that's a good point. So I mentioned earlier about the IPCEI, and the name of our project is called the, the Green Hippo. A hippo meaning heat and power, getting back yeah. to producing electricity and power. Um, this plant that we're building in Western Macedonia, uh, the target there is to be able to produce 1.5 gigawatts of electrolyzers over six years, and uh, 120 megawatts of fuel cell power. And so that really is a, a factory for scaling up. The Hood Park, uh, this new facility, is there to really develop the manufacturing processes that make this factory increase possible. So. so when we talk about acting globally and scaling up, I assume that your unique selling point of being fuel flexible 
is a big advantage, particularly when bringing your technology to any country in the world. Is that the case? Yes, that's the case, and it's, it's an interesting one. Because uh, here, we all think about hydrogen. Um, but one of the questions we have is, uh, it, we can see great ways to make hydrogen here. There's even hydrogen storage companies with tanks. But then there's the distribution, right? How do you move it around? And not necessarily our opinion, but one of the opinions out there is that you can take the hydrogen uh, and combine that with, say, CO2 and make methanol. They yeah. call that e-methanol. There are other e-fuels as well. There's liquid organic hydrogen carriers. You see those here. So that really solves a key problem of how do you move that hydrogen around efficiently and safely. And our fuel cell technology is actually one of the few ones that can take virtually any one of these fuels, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, e-methanol, and convert that into energy at the end. That's what makes us special. That's great. Yeah. So you already talked a little bit about e-fuels right now. Yeah. Um, so that opens basically the discussion that we always, like always have re repeatedly, um, like what is the best um, fuel or technology for the future when it comes to commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. So is it best to drive a battery electric vehicle? Is it best to drive a fuel cell vehicle? Um, or is there a place for e-fuels? Um, what's your personal opinion on that topic? Yeah, I, I don't have a, a best, like this is the solution. Okay. And, and a little bit has, harks back to your earlier question too about uh, uh, where you are in the world uh, and where that country is, is based and what is their energy source. Uh, so I don't see it as a, as a best, this is the solution. With regards to EVs and fuel cells, it's largely about scale, right? If you have a, a small vehicle and you're driving around the city, I think your battery is perfect, it's fine. Uh, but once you get to larger vehicles or longer travel times, a battery really just cannot store enough energy. And it's really the energy of that hydrogen or the hydrogen carrier that really makes the difference. Um, so that's where you start to get into these hybrids of fuel cell uh, battery vehicles. So it basically depends on application, it depends on the personal needs of the people and yeah. the circumstances around it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm looking at the clock, we don't have much time left. Maybe one short question from the audience in case there is one. Otherwise, I would like to invite all of you to continue the discussion. Um, at the booth of Advent, which is D47 slash 1. Yes. So it was which direction? Uh, that way. Right here. <laughs> so feel free to visit them, continue the discussion. It was a pleasure to have you right. here. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it and too. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again. We will. Bye. Great. Bye now.